This is Jeffrey Sachs, editor of Tradition, with another installment in our podcast. In this episode of the Tradition or Chadash series, Shlomo Zukir discusses the presence of Hasidism in contemporary modern Orthodox life. The series host, Alon Meltzer, queries Zukir about his contribution to Tradition's Rabbi Norman Lamb Memorial Volume, in which he analyzed Rabbi Lamb's approach to Hasidut and how it formulated a key element in his manifesto of Torah Umada. Visit traditiononline.org to read Shlomo's essay, sample all of the writings in our recent issues, and check out our YouTube channel for recordings of other episodes in this series. Here's their conversation. A quick introduction and welcome. Uh, once again, welcome to Or Chadash's series, Modern Orthodoxy, uh, where we're thinking, uh, thinking through various issues and uh, areas of, of thought with eight different scholars from around the world on uh, Rabbi Lamb's uh, writings and teachings over his illustrious life and career. Uh, this is in collaboration with Tradition, Journal of Jewish Thought, and uh, as pa it's part of the memorial edition of Tradition uh, that was made in honor of Rabbi Lamb. Uh, tonight, uh, before we begin, I will uh, acknowledge the Bidjigal and Gadjigal people, the traditional owners of the land in which I stand, pay homage to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Uh, and I'll welcome everyone from Australia, from Israel, from the United States, and most importantly, uh, we'll welcome Rabbi Dr. Shlomo Zukier, a friend and chaver of mine. Uh, we both uh, graduated together from Yeshiva University's uh, Rabbi Yitzchak Elchanan uh, Theological Seminary, where we both uh, got smicha. Uh, Rabbi Zukia is far more illustrious than I am. Uh, he's the Director of Education and a member of the Drusha faculty. Um, he has, he's a research fellow uh, in philosophy of religion at Notre Dame. He received his PhD in ancient Judaism at Yale University, and he was a member of Yeshiva University's advanced kolel, the Kolel Elyon. Um, he was a JLIC rabbi, a rabbi on uh, Yale campus, um, and he studied at both uh, Yeshivat Haaretzion and at Yeshiva University. He's been involved in a number of different fellowships, most notably uh, the Wexler and Tipper fellowships. He's an incredible teacher, um, a good friend, and we are very, very lucky to hear him speak tonight. Uh, rabbi Zukia will be speaking on the idea of Hasidut and modern orthodoxy based on his article in the memorial uh, volume uh, of tradition and that article can be found uh, in your emails uh, in the folder with all of the various articles from all of the speakers that we've had uh, thus far and will have over the next few weeks without further ado i'll pass it over to rabbi zukir thank you very much Roy Meltzer, for that uh, for that introduction and it's a real pleasure to be learning with you all at or uh, just a couple of notes on where we are in the calendar uh, before I get into the topic itself. So first of all, uh, you know, good evening to you. For me, it's now 6 a.m. and I'm, I'm very excited about this fact because uh, I just went through Shavuos and had a chance to learn Torah until the uh, deepest hours of the night, right before Shachris. And uh, now I have a chance, when am I ever gonna have a chance to give a shir at 6 a.m. right after davening at the uh, Vasikin Minyan, right after Shachris? I don't know if I ever will. So this, uh, in light of what uh, Valajan, the Yeshiva Valajan, they used to have 24-7, someone always learning uh, in their in their base medrash. Uh, so it's a chance, at least personally, to have, you know, to hit my uh, 6 a.m., uh, my 6 a.m. Uh, learning period, at least at one point over my, uh, over my life. So thank you for the opportunity for that. And the second note about, uh, about schedule or calendar will relate to, to uh, Rabbi Lamb of blessed memory. Um, we just marked his second yard site, um, he passed away right at the end of Shavuos two years ago. So I think uh, you know, discussing Rabbi Lamb and, and his thought and how it relates to modern orthodoxy more broadly uh, is especially pertinent right now. Uh, and especially the idea, if we're thinking about Hasidus, as we will, about Hasidut, uh, which places a real premium on, on marking yard sites, uh, it's especially uh, especially timely in that way as well. So I'm going to share the screen 
uh, in a moment. Before we get there, and we're going to look at some, some of Rabbi Lamb's writings, before we get there, I'll just note something that I'm guessing has come up in earlier iterace, iterations of this series, which is just to note the, the uh, broad reach of Rabbi Lamb within modern orthodoxy. Not only was the rabbi of several synagogues, including a couple of very prominent ones, uh, the Jewish Center and, and uh, before that KJ in Manhattan, uh, and uh, obviously being the president of YU and writing several books, but really he created the frame not just for, uh, not just really building the model of, of uh, what it means to be a successful pulpit rabbi, but also building an intellectual modern orthodoxy through founding tradition, which, uh, which he did. And, and you know, it's a whole, a whole story there that, that, I, that uh, maybe we won't tell now, but for another time, uh, founding uh, the Toromada project and then Toromada journal, different uh, and, and, uh, and through his own writing, and through his own mentorship of students and promotion of people within YU, he really built a place where Torah obviously was engaged very seriously as it always has been at YU, but also uh, to, to make sure that secular studies, uh, philosophy, history, other areas of study would also be taken very seriously and thought of in connection with Torah, how to, how to integrate the two, how to think about the two in light of one another. And uh, that in some sense was, has been his most lasting contribution, building that structure uh, for modern orthodoxy institutional uh, through, through YU and through the journals he founded uh, and intellectually overall, while at the same time um, building uh, modern orthodoxy as a community through his work in shuls, through his leader, his sort of uh, leadership uh, of the community uh, from his perch at YU. And one of the things we're going to have in mind as we look at these sources on Hasidus is sort of bridging the gap as it were, between the more intellectual side of his leadership and the more social or communal side. Those don't always go hand in hand. Uh, so that'll be something that, uh, that we'll keep an eye on. So with, without, uh, without further ado, let's jump in to this, uh, this handout on modern orthodoxy, Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb and Hasidut. And first, it's important to note that uh, Rabbi Lamb's Hasidic inklings are not just theoretical, but also come from his own background. He notes he came from a Hasidic background somewhat uh, through one of his grandfathers, Rav Yeshua Baumel, was, uh, wrote different, uh, wrote different sfarim on different halachic issues, um, and uh, came from a Tzanzer Hasidic background. And the other, his other grandfather wasn't a Rav, but uh, was a, a follower, was a Hasid of the Belzer Rav. So in, in uh, Rabbi Lamb himself notes, both in this interview, but also, as we'll see in his volume on Hasidut, notes his own background through uh, his own Hasidic lineage and how that really contributed to his interest in and, and focus on, uh, in many ways, that area. Rabbi Lamb wrote this, or, or uh, I guess wrote and edited this volume on the religious thought of Hasidism, text and commentary. It's really a massive tome, uh, several hundred pages, going through all sorts of themes in Hasidic thought with translation of primary sources and then explication and analysis uh, engaging with the academic literature. And really, it's not really, there's no parallel to this in terms of a reader on Hasidic thought that's as extensive and as detailed as this in English. And so, it, you know, it's accessible. I think it was, I believe it was, uh, it was organized around the course that he taught, taught at YU on Hasidut and it won the 1999 a National Jewish Book Award uh, for a book in, in Jewish studies. And in opening this, uh, this book in, in the dedication, he says, the volume is dedicated to the memory of two sainted Hasidic masters and uh, in, who, in whose modest synagogues I prayed in my youth, he writes. These two different shuls where, uh, where Rabbi Lamb uh, growing up used to daven. And he notes them and gives them the uh, appropriate honor, the appropriate kavod, in the introduction to his volume. So we see there was real influence on Ray Lamb, both from his grandfathers and their Hasidic roots, and just sort of growing up in a Hasidic context in, uh, in, a, in these different shtibles uh, among, among these Hasidic rabbis. But what, where, where do we see though, the, the sort of uh, payoff, the, the uh, not just in Rabbi Lamb sort of writing about Hasidut in general, but in his own thought, where do we see uh, Hasidic themes playing a role. And somewhat surprisingly, we're going to see this is going to come up in the very 
idea of Torah umada, and just quick note, I mentioned it before, but Torah umada literally means Torah and science, or uh, maybe better, Torah and Wissenschaft, the German term for science, but really of all knowledge, Torah and knowledge and, uh, and the study of the various disciplines. And uh, Rabbi Lamb made this really the, uh, the motto of Yeshiva University when he was running it, the idea being that Yeshiva University has very serious Torah study uh, and has very serious secular studies. And in addition to that, there's the idea of fusing the two, Torah umada, right? The one Torah and secular studies with, with the idea of some sort of integration uh, it, to one degree or other happening at the university level. And I think also for him, uh, he really saw that as an educational ideal and maybe even just an ideal of living as a Jew to always think about the relation between specific uh, uh, Torah ideas and uh, particularist ideas. And at the same time, keeping in mind the broader world of the sciences, the humanities, knowledge writ large, uh, a more universal view on the world and thinking about the two in conjunction with one another always. Rabbi Lamb in his, his book, Torah Umada, points to several different models uh, for how to justify this approach, where to get it from, right? You, you, don't, you don't necessarily see it immediately. You open the Talmud, it says, everyone should study secular studies. You, know, you, don't, you don't necessarily have sources like that. There are many historical figures of great Torah scholars who also spent a lot of time studying uh, philosophy, medicine, other fields. But in terms of building a, a sort of a philosophical justification, Ray Lamb has several different models in his book, and one of them being the Hasidic model. And in fact, this is the model that he actually prefers among all the models in his volume. So how does this work? Right, generally, historically, as Ray Lamb himself says, Hasidut is not usually seen as the most philosophical or the most intellectual, uh, certainly in terms of secular wisdom, of the different modes of Judaism. So he, he, he notes this himself at the outset, a Hasidic model for Torah Omada, the suggestion itself, the very conjunction of the two terms seems implausible, if not incredible. And he notes Hasidic masters banned alien studies and it generally didn't even come up. They didn't believe in studying philosophy. Uh, Rabbi Nachman, the uh, well-known Hasidic master, thought that you need simple faith, not, uh, not intellectual faith. And uh, that's why speculation and science shouldn't be pursued. So how does this work? Uh, he says our task is a formidable one, this idea of trying to justify Rabbi Lamb's overall educational model, this idea of integrating Torah and secular studies, doing that in light of uh, Hasidic thought is going to be somewhat complicated, not so simple. And yet this is the path that he goes down. And in fact, the path that he finds most fruitful. So what, what is, what's the argument here? So he notes, he starts off by talking about the emphasis on uh, in Hasidism of divine imminence of God being inside the world, close to us, rather than transcendent, sort of beyond the world and, and distant. And God being within the world, this Hasidic idea, uh, that invests the world with the possibility and promise of holiness. And I'll read the line here, the ordinary, trite, mundane, natural world was suddenly opened up to the creative spiritual energies of, Hasid of Hasidism, uh, brimming with a divine enthusiasm, an unquenchable flame of faith. As soon as you say that God isn't Beyond the world, God sort of created the world and runs it from a distance, but doesn't engage directly, isn't reachable uh, in this world. It's, it's so much harder to relate to God. As soon as you say, though, that God is imminent in the world, God dwells within the, uh, the world, every fiber of our existence, it becomes a lot easier to see God's, uh, God's presence within everything. And he notes this idea, for going back to the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Chassidut, of Avodah Begashmiut serving God with physicality, worshiping God with uh, one's physical uh, body. And sort of classically in Hasidic thought, this means uh, through things like eating, right? Uh, and let's say the, the Hasidic rabbi eats, uh, they have a tish Friday night, he eats some kugel and he passes around the rest of the kugel to his followers, the shirayim, and eating the kugel, somehow you're connecting to, uh, to God through that act of eating. The act of eating something that's you know from the Rebbe from a holy place that sort of emphasizes the divine sparks, the divine holiness within that kugel, and by eating it, you're you're uh, you're somehow growing religiously, spiritually. You're connecting to God through physicality. That's more a, a classical Hasidic idea, and Rabbi Lamb's going to take that a step further. So he writes the concept of Abu Dhabi Gashmiut is that God's imminence 
in all creation, in nature, as well as in Torah, means that the mundane physical order represents a legitimate avenue of approach to God, right? You can approach God through physical things. It doesn't need to be Torah study. It can be the food you're eating. It can be the, the very mundane work you're doing. That manual labor can also be a way of connecting to God. And by doing so, uh, Hasidism insisted that the perimeters of divine worship be expanded to include all life and all times. And of course, this was one of the goals of, of original Hasidut was to make Judaism more relatable for the average Jew who wasn't necessarily studying Talmud all day and didn't have, you know, was doing the basic things you needed to do to survive in Eastern Europe, um, working, uh, working very hard to provide for, for one's family uh, and doing things like eating, very basic mundane activities to invest those with spirituality, to make that an avenue of connection to God. That was one of the main goals of early Hasidut. And Roy Lamb now says, let's take this a step further. It should by now be obvious that there's a very small step from Abu Dhabi Gashmir to Torah Umada, from worship through corporeality to worship through intellectuality, from the service of God with the body, the service of God with the mind. Uh, and right, that's the jump to say that just like you can serve God through eating, through working, you can also uh, serve God through thinking. And uh, even if we might say thinking is more spiritual in some sense, but it need not be Jewish source, uh, sources of thinking, Jewish texts that you're studying for you to serve God through, uh, through your intellectual work, through, let's say, for example, a college student studying philosophical texts, literature. And the key is to direct one's actions to think, I'm doing this as a way of serving God, the same way that in the classical Hasidic context, you can't, just eating kugel doesn't make you serve God. But if you do it with a sense of, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm directing my thoughts, I'm directing my focus towards the service of God, then actually that does work. It does serve to be a, a form of worship. And the same thing within the context of, uh, of uh, Mada, of studying secular studies, Roy Lamb suggests. And he says, therefore, Mada's significance, right? The significance of secular studies is established not only because we can assign it a value of Talmud Torah on a lower level. That was a different model, he said. Maybe, it, you know, studying secular studies is sort of like studying Torah, but a bit less, a bit less so. Not just that, uh, but because it is in its own right a sacred activity. Because it's, right, it's part of our acting in the world, a world that God is very much present in. And if we direct our actions towards God, that's a form of serving God. That's a sacred activity provided, he writes, and is always provided that it is pursued as an act of Avodan Hashem, right? Not, you don't study but just because you want to or, uh, or uh, in order to make a living, but you're doing it as part of your service of God, then it actually becomes that. It actually becomes a way of, of relating to God through intellectual activity. And he again writes, this is the sublime insight of Hasidism, that all of creation, in all its incredible complexity and fantastic richness, is only an illusion, a disguise for the Ein So, meaning the infinite, meaning God, a mask for the divinity that pulsates through all of existence. God is in this world. Everything we look at, it, it looks like it's physical, but it's not really. Everything really is just part of God's world, part of God's creation. It's a piece of God in some sense. And the goal is to see through that, to see through the physicality and realize that one can uh, worship God, one can relate to the God's spiritual being through the physical world. And, uh, and that's, this, that's this idea of serving God through, through uh, uh, secular studies that Rabbi Lamb suggests. And uh, as noted, he really found this to be his most, uh, his most uh, successful model of the ones that he presents as to why one would justify, how one would justify secular studies as uh, religiously meaningful, as something that you know, uh, his, his, the students in his orthodox uh, university should pursue as a, as a worthwhile uh, way of spending time, not just for pragmatic reasons to get a job later, but, uh, but as part of their service of God, studying secular studies as part of that goal. And interestingly enough, he again invokes his grandfather in explaining the basis of this idea. This is in a note, a lengthy note, uh, focusing on this idea of Abu Dhabi Gashmiut, serving God through physicality, and why that really is at the center of Rabbi Lamb's educational philosophy of Torah Mada. So he writes that uh, this naturalization of Abu Dhabi Gashmiut um, is borne out by his experience. And he notes his grandfather, Rabbi Baumol, the, the halachist, the decisor, 
author of different volumes. Uh, so on the one hand, his grandfather was very intellectual. He wrote all these halachic works. And at the same time, he was from a Galician Hasidic background and was immersed in Hasidic lore and experience. And he writes about this story right before his grandfather passed away in 1948, where he wrote a short list of his religious principles. And um, this is one of the principles on his list. And we'll just read it uh, to, to see some of the influence on Rai Lam uh, from his grandfather in terms of this ideology. He writes, you must know clearly that the will of the creator is to act kindly towards us and every act we perform to do good for others or for ourselves. That's all a fulfillment of his will. Hence, even when we are engaged in such things as eating and drinking and other enjoyable activities in keeping with the laws of the Torah, right? You, whatever you do, you're eating food, but it's kosher or you're working, but you're not uh, working in an immoral, uh, non-halachic way. Even when we are occupied in such activities to improve our condition so that we might live in greater peace of mind and the like, we are in communion with him, may he be blessed, by carrying out his will, just as we do when we lay the tefillin or perform other mitzvot. For what is the difference between them since both are his will? And uh, this is a, a really powerful idea that if you see everything that one does as part of God's will, so then doing a mitzvah, a ritual act, that's part of God's will. God says, um, let's say to eat matzah on Pesach, you eat matzah on Pesach, you're fulfilling God's will. That's a mitzvah. That's an important thing. That's a spiritual act. But so too, one's physical activities. If they're fulfilling God's will, if you're eating, but eating in a permitted way, and maybe even more so if you're eating with the goal of serving God uh, in one way or another, that equally is service of God. That equally is a spiritual activity and uh, should be seen in that vein. And this is, this is the, uh, the approach of Rabbi Lamb's grandfather that he himself internalized and then used and expanded to, uh, to this idea of intellectual activity also serving as, uh, as an example of serving God. And it, right, it makes sense. There's no reason to limit uh, the, the expanded service of God to serving God through physicality. That's almost a, a coincidence that that's what the original Hasidic thinkers thought about. There's no reason Rabbi Lamb says that it shouldn't be expanded to include uh, intellectual activity. And if you think on a, on a sort of historical, cultural level, this makes a lot of sense. If the Hasidic masters of the 18th and 19th century were trying to make life in Eastern Europe more spiritual, to find God in different areas of that, well, what life consisted of then, which was a very uh, a basic existence, a lot of manual labor and uh, and uh, you know the uh, the physical in, in engagement with the world on a, on a basic level. That's that's the world they lived in. If you're going to translate that into 20th century United States Hasidic ideals, I, a way of connecting to people in that context, and you're talking, uh, you're you know if you're writing as a president of a university. Uh, in New York City, it makes sense that what people are spending most of their time doing, intellectual activity, being university students, that that would take center stage, that you would center the intellectual part of experience and finding God there, uh, rather than the sort of original model, which focused much more on physicality. And that really was uh, Rabbi Lamb's uh, great contribution here. And to sort of sum this up, he writes that it's precisely that which is provided by the Hasidic imminentist vision of the world, right? Remember, this is all based on the idea that God is not far beyond the world, maybe governing from afar, but is within the world itself, that imminent uh, vision of the world bursting with the potential and promise of holiness, yearning for the redemptive touch of the sanctifying soul, and the consequent bending of all one's talents, propensities, physical needs, emotional fulfillments, and cognitive gestures to the service of the Holy One, so that every single facet of one's total being becomes an offering of love to one's maker really a beautiful formulation of this idea. And of course, this, this, this approach far transcends the cognitive realm, right? You can serve God in any aspect of life that includes intellectual activity, but is no way limited to it. Right? Lamb himself even suggests that maybe there should be a prayer that people could offer uh, before studying secular studies as a way of ensuring that they're really directing their activity towards God instead of uh, for more selfish purposes. And uh, right here's the prayer in, in Hebrew and in English. The master of prayers, the one to whom all petitions are directed, has touched my lips and opened my heart and granted me the gift of prayer. 
though I'm unworthy. He's instructing me to compose these words of praise. And this is the prayer that he offers. Uh, I am uh, hereby ready and prepared to fulfill the mitzvah of serving the creator with all of my, uh, all of my things, with everything that I can. As it says, to serve him, to serve God with all of one's heart and soul. Know God in all ways. And it goes on that in different areas of chachma, of wisdom, uh, I should be, be able to serve God uh, by studying Torah, uh, and engaging in both physicality and in spirituality. So to, to combine them and create goodwill for my creator. Uh, and right here's the translation as well. Really a beautiful prayer. I don't know if this was necessarily adopted, but it reflects the approach of Rabbi Lamb here to, to use Hasidic thought as a justification and a, a sanctification of every engagement in life, including and especially that of intellectual engagement. We'll look at one other place where Rabbi Lamb uses Hasidic thought, and this will be a drasha, a sermon that he gave at the Jewish Center for Parshad Yitro, um, which, you know, as I said, we just had, uh, we just celebrated Shavuos, and uh, right, the, the reading on Shavuos is that from, from Yisro, from where the Torah was given, so this will be very relevant to uh, the Shavuos that just passed, and the challenge here, Rabbi Lam is think, trying to think about how to find spirituality in a very secular, technologically advanced world. This was 60 years ago, but that question already existed. Of course, the 60s was an era of great technological advance uh, uh, internationally between America and, and uh, the Soviet Union. And uh, just generally, it was really a, a forward thinking era. You know, uh, uh, Rabbi Lamb himself wrote an essay about alien life in the 60s. That was, that was really on people's minds. So the question is, as technology and science is advancing in all these ways, is there room for spirituality? Is there room for religion? And we'll, we'll see Rabbi Lamb's approach here. And then we'll try to tie that together with, with uh, his approach to Torah and secular studies. So Rabbi Lamb writes, we live in a mundane, secularized world, in a highly technological society in which it's not easy to find inspiration, right? Emotion is not centralized. Uh, there's a focus on facts, not feelings. And we don't er uh, normally feel the urge to pray in utter devotion or learn for the sake of heaven or observe mitzvot because we love God. That's just not part of the culture. The overall culture doesn't emphasize that. And if we think, uh, as he asserts that religion is seen as a matter of human moods. Right? When you're in the mood, you serve God. Okay, great. Uh, you know, do whatever feels right to you. If you're feeling in a spiritual mode, then it's a good time for religion. If not, then not. If you take that approach, then Torah is going to vanish from the world because the overall culture is one that doesn't emphasize the mood of spirituality. If you wait for inspiration before you pray, you usually won't pray because the way uh, the way things function in our in our uh, post-scientific revolution world is that there aren't necessarily, uh, it, religion isn't front and center. God isn't, isn't, uh, isn't a central part of the culture that we're in. And he attempts to solve this problem. How do we then find God if God is not uh, central to the culture? And he says, this is the, really the issue that the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of, Has, of Hasidur, tries to solve. And uh, the, in the Torah reading of, that we read on Shavuos in Parshas Yisro, talking about how the Jewish people encamped by Yisiyatzu B'Sachti Sahar. They camped at the bottom of the mountain, or maybe if you read that hyperliterally, under the mountain. They camped under the mountain. What does that mean? So the Gemara says, Kafalehem Har Kigigit, that the mountain was set over them like a barrel. And they were told, either accept the Torah, or if you don't, you'll be crushed by the mountain. You'll be buried here. So in this case, uh, one way of putting it is God chose the people of Israel. They literally had no choice. They either accepted the Torah or they died. So what can we learn from this? Right? Usually we don't. We think coercion is uh, not necessarily an ideal. What can we learn from this idea? And the Baal Shem Tov, as quoted by a student, teach, says this teaches that even when a person doesn't have overwhelming desire for Torah or service of the Lord, even if you don't feel you know, turned on to spirituality in the moment, nevertheless, He's not free to desist from them, right? That doesn't exempt you. If you say, well, I'm not feeling so spiritual today, that doesn't exempt you from engaging in spirituality, from uh, davening chakras, as it were. You have to imagine 
right? This is not, doesn't mean that God actually forced Israel. It means that even when you're having a challenge connecting to spirituality, connecting to religion, you should imagine that you're being forced to do it, just like uh, God did at Sinai. But it's more of a, a, a sort of a technique of self-motivation to realize that even if you don't feel moved to spirituality, there's still a reason to engage in it. And the Baal, Tov conclude, Baal Shem Tov concludes, this is a proper uh, thing for a person to do during Yemei Kapnut, literally the days of smallness. And this is a, uh, you know, became a very broad Hasidic idea that sometimes people, you know, people go through cycles in life. Sometimes you have Yemei Gadlut, where you sort of feel big, you feel great, you feel connected to God, and this great sense of, uh, of, uh, of uh, fullness. And sometimes you feel you may cut new during the days of, of smallness. You feel maybe even a sense of depression. You feel a sense of alienation, a disconnect from God and from the world. And in those times of you may cut new, of, of smallness, one needs to overcome that. One needs to sort of force oneself to connect. And Rabbi Lehm himself says there are days, though there's years, decades even, when we're small, our capacities are limited, our spirit puny, our soul desiccated, our sensitivity parched. Our hearts shrunken and dried up. Society pushes us towards a constant trivialization. So Ray Lamb expands this idea. He says, really, this period, you know, 1962, when he's writing, this is a time of Yemei Katnut where religion is minimized. And the response to that can't be, well, I'm not feeling it, so I'm going to disengage from religion. The, 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 the response has to be that to realize that, that religion plays a broader role. God is in the world. And even if you're not feeling it at the moment, to overcome that lack of connection, that lack of the feeling that's missing, to overcome that lack and connect nevertheless to God and to religion. And that's what he's, he writes in these Yimei Katnut, we cannot summon up the spirit from the resources within us. We must not desist from prayer, from Torah, and from mitzvot. And the truth is, this uh, provides a great pleasure. Uh, and, and by praying, by engaging in, in spirituality and Torah study, in religious life, that then leads one to the Yemea Gadlut, to feeling, again, that sense of fullness, that sense of greatness, that sense of connection, a uh, feeling of inspiration, and that's the great reward, right? It says there's no greater reward for practicing the disciplines of oneself that relates, that results in observing and studying and practicing Jewishness during Yemea Akatnut, because that's the only way to arrive at Gadlut, to, to arrive at greatness, is through uh, engaging in spirituality, even when it's difficult to do so. And, um, and that's why he notes uh, that it's, it's almost like a mother who feeds her child when she's inspired by his loveliness rather than when the, the child is hungry. That's the wrong model, right? To think, well, if I feel, if I feel like feeding my child, I'll do so. Uh, that, that, that's not the way we should think about spirituality. Uh, instead, it should, be, it should be felt as a real obligation, something one takes on as a regular commitment, and the payoff is obvious, the long-term payoff is obvious, even if in the moment, you don't necessarily feel it. Um, you know, uh, the baby wakes up at 2 a.m. crying, I can speak from personal experience, I don't always love the idea of, you know, getting uh, a milk bottle ready, but uh, just because I don't feel like it doesn't mean I don't do it, and there's a very good reason why. Uh, in the long-term, long-term results, it pays off, and there'll be many moments when you do feel that appreciation. Um, so Rabbi Lam uh, ends this sermon with this idea of, he, he invokes a prayer himself, uh, the prayer at the end of Shmonesra, May the words of my mouth be pleasing to you, the meditation of my heart come before you, Lord, my, my rock and redeemer. And the idea is, as he explicates, even during the days of smallness, it's only my lips moving and my mouth speaking, right? There's, my heart is mute, there's nothing deeper, Still, Yuleratzon Imrei Fish, that should be pleasing to you, God, in order that when later, when I have that moment of greatness, that sense of fullness, my heart will open up and that will be Hegyoni Bilefanecha. My heart will rise before you as God. And that's, that's the message here uh, to try to overcome those moments of smallness drawing on the Baal Shem Tov. I think both, both of these teachings from Rabbi Lam, first about secular studies and the justification of secular studies and bridging between secular study and Torah study and spirituality overall, number one. And then number two, bridging here in this, uh, this sermon between uh, the one's feelings of alienation from prayer and the secular world that, that uh, we live in 
the scientific world, bridging between that and a life of spirituality, I think there's really a common thread here, which is that of integration, of overcoming obstacles, of overcoming gaps, and really seeing everything as integrated in, in the world. Um, and I think the, the way you do that, this is where a Hasidic thought comes in, is through seeing God very much imminent in the world. In fact, if you look in, in Hasidic thought, where Lam himself writes about this in his volume on Hasidut, there's sort of this challenge, really it's a challenge in many areas of Jewish thought, but including in Hasidut of how to, how to bridge between a God that seems absolutely beyond the world and creator of the world as almost this, you know, very dist in a very distant sense and God that's very much present. And, and somehow one has to overcome that dichotomy. One has to hold in their head simultaneously the idea that God is beyond the world, uh, but, but, and that maybe understand that as an intellectual matter, but as a practical matter, as a mode of engaging with God, to see God as very much present within the physical world, within every detail of this world we're in. And that's, that's a way of overcoming that, uh, that gap. And same, the, the same here with these two examples of integration, to be able to somehow overcome the dichotomy and not just say, well, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's God, God is very spiritual, our world is very physical, there's no way of bridging that gap. No, to see God in every aspect uh, of this world and to see God even when it's difficult to see God in the world. So these are two teachings from Rabbi Lamb that uh, I think beautifully draw on, on Hasidic thought and really justify uh, an engagement with the world, both engagement overall in whatever sense, and especially an engagement in a spiritual sense, uh, sorry, in an intellectual sense, I should say, uh, as Rabbi Lamb uh, promoted at YU. And then also using that as a mode of engagement and inspiration for people who may not always feel the most natural pull, right? If you're living in a, in a community that's totally uh, religiously focused and everyone around you is pursuing religious activities at all times, it's, it's often easier to engage in, in religious activity. It's sort of what everyone's doing. As soon as you're in the secular world, this is a, a, you know, you have a job alongside other people who are not religious in any way um, and you're studying things that have, have no religious uh, direct content. These challenges, come up. These are modern orthodox challenges in a sense, and Rai Lam uses the resources of Hasidism to try to overcome them. Um, I'll quickly point now to some broader trends within modern orthodoxy relating to Hasidut that I think draw on what Rai Lam uh, built in different ways, and this, uh, this uh, you know, appeared in the tradition volume. I shouldn't say forthcoming because it's very much out, uh, the tradition volume uh, in, in tribute to Rabbi Lamb and my, my contribution there, which is that Rabbi Lamb uh, saw Hasidut as the preferred theological grounding for the concept of Yeshiva University, for Torah Umada, as we saw, but he also worked to build uh, a sense of, uh, build the study of Hasidic thought within YU. Um, right by the time Rabbi Lamb left YU, the three, he had three collaborators on his volume on Hasidic thought, uh, Dr. Alan Brill, Brill Rabbi Shalom Karmi, Dr. Yaakov Elman, uh, Rabbi Elman, uh, Dr. Elman uh, of blessed memory now, but each, all three of them he had brought on to, to YU to teach Jewish thought and some to teach particularly Hasidic thought. So he really wanted to in integrate Hasidic thought into the educational experience at YU as well. And I, I just note here that that's really not so obvious. The culture at YU, the overwhelming culture of YU since its founding has been uh, Litvish, meaning Lithuanian. And in many senses, uh, uh, misnagdic or anti-Hasidic, right? Lith there sort of was a, uh, you know, a Hungary versus Lithuania rivalry where Hungary was more Hasidic uh, and about uh, sort of somewhat ecstatic spirituality through engagement in the physical, whereas Lithuanian Judaism, most, and like the yeshiva sense of things was very much intellectual and rejected Hasidic uh, thought, some of the novelties of, of Hasidism. And YU was overwhelmingly Litvish, overwhelmingly Lithuanian from Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik and basically all the other Russia yeshiva, uh, uh, nearly all of them uh, coming from Lithuania or at least taking up that sort of approach. And uh, it was not at all obvious that YU needed to engage with Hasidic thought, either as an educational, uh, you know, as, an, as an educational ideology and model, as Rabbi Lamb had it, and certainly not to have courses on Hasidut, but Rabbi Lamb went out of his way. This was a commitment he had, uh, part of having a broad, a broad model of what YU educated for, to build this Hasidic model into YU as well. So that's one note. And then something very interesting, 
um, really over the past 10 or 15 years, especially, uh, ironically, especially since Rabbi Lamb uh, retired from his role as president, we've seen that there's been an embrace of Hasidut by many at, at YU. Um, and in, in some sense, uh, YU's moved in a Hasidic direction. And you know, I, I can go on, there's a whole, a whole host of developments in this way, different uh, mashpiyim, sort of Hasidic uh, educators slash influencers who have been at YU in educational roles in the last decade and a half, and students who both, now let's say from their time studying in Israel, were inspired in a Hasidic direction and continued that at YU, all sorts of uh, pop-up minyanim that are much more ecstatic and Hasidic in nature. Some people sort of dressing the part of, uh, you know, looking like a Hasidim at, while, while studying at YU. These are all developments that have come up in, in the YU world in the last decade and a half. And actually this, uh, this volume just came out uh, that I had the uh, privilege of editing, Contemporary Uses and Forms of Hasidut, which studies this trend at YU and sort of a move in, in this direction towards various forms of Hasidic life at YU, despite YU's Lithuanian past. And there's really two different ways of thinking about this, right? You could say, well, this is, you know, sort of dependent on other social trends. It doesn't directly relate to Rabbi Lamb. It sort of mostly happened after he left uh, his role as president anyway. That's one way of, of, say, of saying it's sort of a, a coincidence. But I think the other way of looking at it, and especially if we're going to try to integrate as Rabbi Lamb always did, uh, we can actually see this as somewhat of a piece with Rabbi Lamb's approach. That, you know, in the period that Rabbi Lamb was at YU, uh, you know, the late 70s, 80s, 90s, into the early 21st century, that was a time when, uh, you know, universities in general were very much invested in, you know, intellectual activity and more a theoretical model. And YU embraced that idea. YU took on uh, that idea of intellectual engagement, including with its engagement with Hasidut. And that's why Rabbi Lamb's Hasidut was very much an intellectual one. He taught academic courses, he brought in faculty, he edited a book on the topic. Of course, in addition to, you know, there's, there was some, uh, some aspects of practice that followed, uh, followed Hasidic models, but it was largely an intellectual embrace of, of Hasidut. And in the period since then, and I think there's a broader trend in the world to focus, uh, you know, for college students, especially to focus more on developing their self and identity and uh, expressing that in, in various ways, alongside intellectual study, of course, but to really emphasize the personal development and growth. At that point, it, it maybe makes sense for YU and uh, the Hasidun at YU to be much more about practice and self-expression and modes of dress uh, in that way. So maybe this actually, it's, it's a development just like the development from Hasidut of the Eastern European shtetl to Hasidut of 20th century uh, 20th century university life to now 21st century. Things are, are a bit less intellectual and a bit more uh, spiritual in terms of and, uh, and Hasidic practice. Maybe this really makes sense as the, the next stage, the next level of development of Hasidut within modern orthodoxy, which really was started in so many ways by Rabbi Lamb. So I'm happy to take some questions now. Uh, and I hope, I hope people uh, learned a lot. Uh, it, certainly these texts and teachings are really fascinating, uh, and I'd, I'd love to engage in some uh, further discussion. Thank you, Rabbi Zukia Aisha Koch. Um, I actually, I want to start off with a question, because one of the things that uh, we've seen over the last sort of 40 years is this greater uh, sort of drift or, or move by especially secular people to Eastern uh, mythology and mysticism, um, and then in the last, sort of, as you noted, in the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen this rise of the neo Hasid, uh, this modern Orthodox sort of intellectual uh, person who is drawn to the mystical elements of Hasidut. You, you touched on that, that as being sort of a, a sort of following the trends of self development and personal development. Is, are we just seeing sort of secularism um, or, or sort of impact? orthodoxy and or perhaps orthodoxy catching up to secularism and that sort of trend what can we can we unpack that a little bit more sure yeah so definitely uh, i think you're definitely right that spirituality has been on the rise the, you know the last few decades uh worldwide i think in israel especially you see this interplay between a, a turn to eastern religion and a turn to 
Judaism, sometimes by the same person. You know, they'll have a stage where they, they you know, they grow up secular, they spend some time in, uh, in uh, you know, India or, or wherever, and, and sort of come back to Israel and then take on more Jewish practice. So sometimes that can exist there. I think American Judaism, you have, uh, let's say, American Orthodox Judaism, you have a lot less of that. I mean, I think in secular American Judaism, you have a lot of uh, people who turn to Buddhism in one way or another. But let's say in the YU world, I don't think you have too much direct engagement with Eastern religion. Sometimes ideas sort of filter in and, you know, meditation, uh, and, you know, in more, in more narrow ways. Um, so there's different ways of thinking about this, right? If you want to be a sort of, uh, you want to be historicist about it, you can say, well, you know, there are these trends and the Jews got swept up in the trend al along with everyone else. I think if you wanted to take a Hasidic approach, you would say, no, that, that this trend is itself, uh, is itself from God, is itself a divine, a divine wind, a divine uh, ruach that's sweeping through the world. And of course, Judaism should get involved in that. Um, but to, to see the divinity in it and see the spirituality in it, rather than to denigrate it. So I think it, to some degree is a matter of perspective, uh, but certainly there, there is this broader trend. I would very much agree, agree with you on that. One of, the, um, one of the interesting things to note is that Rabbi Lamb's sort of growth in his leadership and his tenure as the, the leader of modern orthodoxy sort of parallels the, the rise and growth of uh, the last Rebbe's uh, tenure and, and leadership of Chabad Chassidut. And one of the claims leveled at Rabbi Lamb um, was perhaps that he fostered an orthodoxy that uh, was within an ivory tower and didn't do enough to go outside of the Dalit Amot, outside of sort of that sphere of influence into the wider world and adopt a Chabad Hasidut model of, of outreach and going out into the world. Um, can, we, can we sort of talk about that a bit and, and sort of, you know, thinking about where we are in 2022 and, and sort of where modern orthodoxy is, uh, sort of what, what are the impacts of that? Yeah, I, I think that's a, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think, I think there, it probably makes sense to distinguish between Rabbi Lamb and his time um, before taking on the presidency of YU and after. So before Rabbi Lamb was president of YU, he really, he was the rabbi in a few different places, you know, and, and somewhat far flung, not necessarily, I mean, he was in New York for a, for a period, but he also was in Springfield, Massachusetts, if that means anything uh, to people uh, down under. Um, so he, he, was, he also was in more suburban areas or even, you know, what, places further away from, uh, from urban centers. And that was, I think, that was the model for engaging with people that, that at that point, certainly synagogue Judaism was the primary mode through which Jews engaged. And YU at the time was placing rabbis throughout, throughout North America, maybe even beyond North America. But I think back then it was, things were very local uh, for the most part. Uh, but throughout, you know, throughout all the different areas where Jews were living in North America, and, and that I think was the model. The idea was, um, you know, train rabbis at YU, you know, take these spiritual leaders and then send them all over to tend to their flocks. Um, and I think Ray Lamb, you know, I think during his presidency continued that model, not personally because he was busy being president, but sending uh, YU Musmach and YU trained rabbis out throughout uh, North America. I think as time has gone on, there is a bit less of an appetite by those who train as rabbis to go to uh, to certain types of communities. Again, it varies by person, but I think the number of YU rabbis willing to go to, you know, a community, uh, 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 you know, some, some for some people even outside the New York area, for some outside a, a large metropolitan area with a significant sized Orthodox life is less interesting to people. And so I think what has happened, this is just a fact on the ground, is Chabad, their whole model is to send people to send their shluchim wherever, and so they've done that. And they have people on the ground. They have a lot of very, uh, very energized, very excited, um, and very idealistic shluchim going to communities everywhere. And that's that's their model. So I think you know over the last, uh, probably since Ray Lamb left the pulpit, um, you've seen these these opposite trends. Why you uh, placing fewer people in smaller communities and Chabad doing much more of that. Uh, and I think that's what that's where you see that difference. So, so I guess part, you know, so it's partially a question of, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, sort of a question of both what people are looking for, meaning what the, the rabbis are looking for and, and what's what they're being, you know, to what degree they're being pushed to go to places that are uncomfortable and not easy, right? Of course, it's if you're the only observant Jew within a hundred mile radius, as sometimes these, you know, that's, that's not so simple uh, for them. Um, and uh, so if, 
you know, if you if you could manage to to send people to these places, that's a real accomplishment, um, and that's something that that Chabad certainly has done. And I think why you in the past did it more so, and now is, is it's doing less than it had. Thank you, um, Sarah. I just uh, put a put a question, not so direct, directly related to Rabbi Lam, um, but can you comment on the heightened interest in the writings of Rav Shagar in the context of modern Orthodox near Hasidut? Is this true in the YU world or only further to the left? Okay, uh, yeah, great. So Rav Shagar, well, so I'll, just, I'll just mention who Rav Shagar was because I'm not sure everyone on this call uh, knows it. Um, Rav Shagar was sort of grew up within the Dati Lumi world, the religious Zionist world in Israel uh, in a sort of mainstream vein in a, a Merkaz Harav uh, type of school. And he himself be, uh, was drawn more and more to Hasidic thought as time went on, along with other things. He also studied you know, postmodern thought, was really very uh, broad-minded and voracious in terms of his intellectual interests. And he fostered a small circle of students, but also wrote many writings that are now, you know, more and more are being published that engage some the various questions of the day, you know, questions about Zionism, about connecting to God, about Torah study, to, to different, uh, different approaches in Hasidic thought. Um, actually, in, in, this, uh, in this volume, there's an essay of, uh, on Rav Shigar's thought that, that tries to connect between, uh, Rav Shigar, that deals with Rav Shigar's essay, connecting the idea of Mashiach, the Messiah, and uh, the, the character of Neo in the Matrix. So, anyways, it's a real it's a real trip. Um, it's worth worth reading. Take that uh, take that blue pill or red pill or whatever it is, um, and uh, and read the essay. But um, is the interest only in in the um, in the more uh, is it only to the left of the YU world or also in the YU world? Definitely, some parts of the YU world are interested. I mean, this this book was published by YU Press, if that means anything. Um, but I, there are some, I think some people in the YU world are concerned about uh, Rav Shigar's interest in postmodernism. And, uh, you know, I think postmodernism may already be passe in some circles, but it's in some other circles, it's the battle still being fought. And the question of, you know, can you, uh, if you, if you are open to postmodernism, does that mean you're rejecting the idea of absolute truth? And if you're rejecting the idea of absolute truth, then where does God come in? And Rav Shigar would say, well, God is through, you know, you express your deepest connection to God through your feeling, your sense of God. And, uh, you know, there's, there's somewhat of a skepticism in, in some circles as to, is that really true religious faith? Or is that a more self-serving, you know, I feel like I see God, so I'll go with that. But I, that's not really the true submission to God and the objective seeing of God in the world. So there is that voice within, I'd say, the YU centrist world that's a little skeptical, but there also are some people who have adopted uh, Rav Shigar uh, more deeply. But yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. In Israel, in Israel, I think there's less of a right left. I think there's different iterations of Rav Shigar that people have taken on, um, you know, I think some, some uh, more center, of course, the center in Israel is different than in, than in America or elsewhere. Thank you. Um, just one final question, I think, unless someone else put something in the chat, but one final question from me, at least. Um, obviously, you know, you touched on the fact that there's sort of been this rise of Hasidut, uh, Hasidic engagement at Yeshiva University. Um, with, you know, when I was at YU, when we were both at YU, um, that was when Rabbi Weinberger was was hired um, as the Mashpia and, and sort of occupying a, a new space within the yeshiva and we've set, we certainly have seen a rise um, in a more spiritual or a desire to have a more spiritualistic approach uh, to Judaism um, and I think you know we as a Sydney and Australian Jewish community live within a predominantly um, sort of Chabad leadership um, so we definitely feel that um, that idea of, of spiritualism and of Chassidut within our day-to-day -day life um, is that the new direction for modern orthodoxy to see a greater level of sort of the, of ruach coming alongside the Torah Mada? Um, you know that was the the primary uh, desire of Rabbi Lamb in the sense. Okay, yes, it was from an intellectual perspective, but that's how he framed his Torah Mada. Um, it, is that sort of where we're going to where we're going to see modern orthodoxy move to as as this, this goal to to find sort of more enlightenment and more personal growth and development? Um, on, a, on a general on a general level. 
And that's certainly where the where the trends are going. I, I think so. I mean, I think less less a Chabad influence in in uh, you know in let's say American modern Orthodox circles, but more this you know different neo Hasidic influence from people in Israel from some now uh, even homegrown American rabbis who are who are engaging in that. But yeah, it seems like that's the trend. You look at high schools. There's a lot more uh, a lot more uh, you know tishes or or singing and that sort of thing and a sort of a move away from uh, hyper emphasis on the intellectual, which I think is more, you know, works for more, some students more than for others. Um, so I think the similar to the trend, uh, the trend in YU from a more Lithuanian intellectual centered approach to at least some elements of YU having a much more Hasidically oriented nature. I think you're seeing a similar trend in high schools and obviously, and in some communities. And this is the sort of thing that trickles down and trickles up and trickles across. Um, so I think that is the trend. Um, you know, these things, as, as much as they change in one direction, they can always change elsewhere, but that, that is the way things seem to be moving over the past 10, 15 years. I would agree with your, your, with your assessment there. Interesting. Uh, Rabbi Zukiar, thank you so much. Uh, firstly, it's, oh, it's just lovely to, to see you, uh, to learn from you, and to, to hear, hear your Torah. Um, I really thank you for getting up at six in the morning earlier even uh, and sharing, sharing your Torah with us. As you noted, uh, this sort of Isru Chag post Shavuot is really an a beautiful opportunity to uh, continue that journey in acquisition of Torah, in, acquisition, in, in revelation of Torah. Um, and we're very lucky to have done it with you this evening. Um, thank you very much, thank, everyone. Thank you all. Thank, thank you for, for this opportunity, Rai Meltzer, and thank you everyone for, uh, for the opportunity to learn together.